All right, we are live. Welcome everybody back to another episode of Cloud Talk. We are here every Thursday at noon Eastern time, 9 a.m. Pacific. If you're in another time zone, you can figure that out, that math out yourself. Um, we've been doing this show for a little over two years where we're really talking about everything around cloud computing. The show started off with really more educating people on what cloud was, because as most know that have joined the show, most people, when they talked about cloud, they looked up in the sky as if the cloud meant that it was sitting in the cloud. But thankfully, we've transformed that conversation as the industry over the last two years has got a better understanding of really what cloud means, where cloud fits into their ecosystem and how cloud kind of enables them to do things. So just like cloud, this show actually started off as a Twitter chat. It went to a Google Hangout and Twitter chat. It now is in a blab form where we do the live video as well as we are streaming live on Facebook Live as well, trying to bring the conversation to our audience where they're at rather than make them come to us. So today we got a special episode. First off, as you guys have noticed, I'm missing my uh, co-host, both of Cloud Talk and our podcast, Smack Talk. Uh, Daniel is on the road today giving a keynote that just happened to be uh, at the same time as this show. But last week, I was on stage doing a keynote during the show, and Daniel uh, took up the slack with a great episode with Jen Schultz over there at SAP, which was must watch. If you guys haven't watched that, go ahead and after this show, check back on the, the replays here on Blab. It was a, a great conversation that they had uh, across the board. But uh, as always, we use the hashtag Cloud Talk. Uh, Kristen Cardos, you see her in the uh, in the side there in the chat. She'll be posting the questions both in here in the chat as well as to Twitter. So if you're watching and you don't want to watch our, our faces and you just want to listen, go ahead and open up a second tab in your browser, go to Twitter, put the hashtag Cloud Talk in there, and you can join the conversation uh, on Twitter as well. And we'll try to bring in some of those, uh, those tweets and things um, as we go. So that's for kind of the, the semantics around everything. But uh, Glenn, go ahead and introduce yourself. Let us know where you're kind of coming from, a little bit about your background, and we'll get into some of these questions. Sure thing. Uh, first thing, though, I, one of the comments on the on the scroll on the side is, uh, you know, Brian's an awesome multitasker. Like, no kidding. You know, you look at all the stuff we've just put together in the last 60 seconds. It's uh, it's amazing. So hats off. I, uh, I don't know if I could do what you're doing. So uh, very impressive. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Glenn Moffat. Uh, I work at SAP Canada. I'm coming to you from Toronto today. And uh, my job, actually, I have I wouldn't call it a change evangelist. I, I don't think it, it's, it's anywhere near as glamorous as that, uh, but it's along those lines. I, I work with the, our partner organizations across the, the country. I talk to customers, I talk to partners, I talk to business people, and my job is to talk to them about you know what to do with what's going on with technology these days. So it, there's an evangelistic component to it, I guess, uh, talking to people about you know what SAP is doing. And this is not going to be a big SAP commercial. This is just uh, more of a, a conversation along the lines of the ones that I have with uh, our customers and our partners every day. So nice to meet everybody. Nice to have you here. And actually, I'm going to get in a little bit more on your title here on question one. Um, but, you know, SAP has been a longtime sponsor of the show. We've been lucky we've actually taken our show and our podcast on the road. We're at Sapphire now. Uh, earlier this year, we went to the Super Bowl, uh, Super Bowl City and got to sit down with a lot of the partners, um, have Jonathan Becker and um, some other folks on the show here as well. So we've been very lucky and fortunate. So shout out to SAP, our sponsor that really allows us to have this conversation and really facilitates really what with what we have going on. But we're going to get into question one. And it actually comes down to what I saw as kind of your title, where I saw generalist. And I saw the word generalist in your title, and I loved it because as myself, I said change evangelist because it kind of sounds, uh, you know, I'd say hipper, maybe uh, generalist. But, you know, for me coming out of college and I graduated college in 2003, computer science degree, a lot of what I figured out I was good at was what I like to say, translating geek speak and, and really helping people understand where technology fits in there. And I love being a generalist. It's something that I take a lot of pride in, but it was, it was kind of brought to my attention over the last couple of years that some people look at that term as, you know, up until recently as, you know, master of none, right? And I think understanding what role a generalist is and the fact that you have that as a title, I thought that was kind of a great way of kicking off maybe what aspect of change and where we're living today that allows not only the concept of a generalist, but what does a generalist mean to you in the sense of where we're at kind of in this digital world? Well, it's funny. I, uh, um, it got to a point I was, you know, trying to figure out what title to put on my business card. And, 
it wound up being so long. I just said, you know what, forget it. It's getting ridiculous. Um, one of the, the great things about the, the company I work at is that they, they're into a lot of stuff and our partners and our customers have lots of different questions. And so I've been very fortunate that I can get my finger into a lot of different pies and my background supports that. <clears throat> like you, I have a, a background in computer science. Uh, it's a little before 2003, but, but, uh, I think it's still relevant these days. And, uh, you know, I'm not interested in being the guy who specializes in that one little piece of that one little product. Um, I think there's just too much going on. It's a, it's a lot more interesting to survey things. And frankly, I think that's the way a lot of business people look at it too. Um, if you have to have a conversation, especially with, you know, more senior business people, they see a, a wider landscape and, uh, you know, I do what you do. Um, I've been doing it for a long time, translating uh, from the geek into the boardroom or into whatever, you know, a, uh, go talk to a salesperson or a purchasing person or a manufacturing person and just tell them what all this stuff really means to them. That to me is the interesting part of the job and, uh, and that's why I do it. So I'm curious, kind of like a follow up on that, you know, I, I love it because I think we need more of that. Uh, we, we talk a lot, a lot on this show that people don't buy technology for technology's sake. They buy it to solve a business problem, create a new experience, maybe streamline an old experience so that they can have um, new experiences. But you know, as far as that concept and maybe the, even the the need for businesses, you know, I like to say that the data center was purchased as a real estate play by a CIO, right? And and they were kind of the they were the one that had the, the budget and, and made a lot of the purchasing decisions. But I think with, with the change out of the data center and in the cloud and more SaaS based solutions, the need for that really interpretation of technology into business sake has come to the, the forefront. But would you say it's always been there and now we just kind of see it more? Or what role does that play in like kind of that understanding of that translation? Is it is it cloud is it cloud enabled to where that role is now seen as a necessity? Or is that something that's just been there and now we kind of have the bigger, I'd say, soapbox as social media to kind of expose? I think the cloud's been a, a huge contributor to it because you're seeing like just a pervasiveness of technology now. You know, what is it Mark Anderson said software is going to eat the world? Yes. And I think we've seen that. So you see, you know, in uh, in businesses now like the footprint of where software goes. You know, it used to be, okay, okay, we're going to do accounting or we're going to do manufacturing. We're going to do like just sort of the back office stuff. Now it's everywhere um, and it covers so much more waterfront. And it's really important uh, to have those interpreters, those geek interpreters or evangelists or whatever you want to call us to be able to talk to people and say, yeah, this particular thing over here, that's worth paying attention to. And here's why. No, I love that. And um, I would say, I'm guessing you don't have a background. If you worked at a job in marketing, let's say, like a, a traditional marketing uh, job in your past? Um, I'll just say this. I've been kicked out of just about every job you can do in the software business and a few that aren't. So <clears throat> very briefly, I was a marketing director, um, and uh, but th that was some time ago. So I always, we always say that you know Daniel is our token marketing uh, person in the conversation because I came from that tech space and I absolutely love the marketing and social media space where we're going today. But you know, question number two and where I want to kind of get this is the buzzwords transformation, uh, you know, disruption. Uh, really, the, I I believe you know part of that is you know kind of like iCloud kind of ruined the cloud conversation for so many because that really wasn't cloud and Apple kind of just threw it out there and really made us all confused. I, I love your post and we're gonna get a little bit more into the unicorn divide piece, but before we get into like kind of understanding where this is going, is transformation and disruption more marketing buzz or more truth of this, you know, what Mark Andreessen said on software eating the world, but is it eating the world to the point of mass disruption or how do you kind of look at that when when a business says like i see disruption and transformation everywhere what, what does that really mean for businesses today well i think it's both i think it's uh it's real and it's hype and you know that's the one thing about the software business i've been doing this a long time and there is nobody who will jump on the bandwagon jump on some buzzwords and just beat it like beat it into the ground. There's nobody like the IT business for doing that. And, you know, I salute them for, for their enthusiasm. But, you know, you know what I've seen lately, and I don't know about, about your thoughts or, or maybe the, the thoughts of the people watching, is that 
I've seen it go a little more negative than it, than it has in the past. Like there's always been to me, you know, that tone that, uh, you know, you read Wired magazine, there's always that optimistic tone, right? Here's what's coming for the future. And I think we've kind of lost a little bit of that. I think this disruption thing has gotten a bit out of hand and I think it's turned a little bit negative. You know, I, I agree with you. And I think for me, I think it actually has a lot to do with the rate of change that we're seeing today. Because I think disruption probably has been a conversation much like cloud. We kind of knew cloud was gonna change kind of how we, how we purchase software, how we talk about software, even how we integrate, even how we get rid of the software we don't like. Uh, I worked in the Department of Defense uh, for nine years and we deployed SharePoint across the DOD and then um, some McAfee antivirus solutions. And I remember we were four years into a deployment of, of a McAfee solution that was two years old of what you could buy on McAfee.com. And it was kind of what not only a little bit to do with the government, but a little bit to do with the, you know, we were deploying it to every single node in the DOD across um, the network. And I think today the rate of change is so fast that rather than looking at disruption as what it can enable us. I think we often look at it and say, change is happening too quick. Like, let's just, just hate change or let's just look at it only as a negative connotation so that we you know, don't have to embrace it because it is kind of coming at a rate faster than we have before. And I'm curious from, from your perspective, you know, working at SAP, you know, even we've talked a lot about with SAP Small Business and a lot of the people that come to this show, you'll hear comments like, I had no idea SAP had a solution for me, the small business. I thought this was, a solution that was only enterprise, or I didn't realize the SAP store existed where I could purchase, you know, kind of software on demand. And, and I think that evolution of really SAP's, uh, you know, transformation into how they kind of convey the software and how they present themselves to the market has a lot to do with kind of the same rate of change that we see today. How have you seen that change over your time at SAP? And, and really how does that disruption transformation fit into, into kind of your experience there? Well, I guess there's a, a couple different threads to pick up there that in terms of the the uh, the rate of change you know obviously we've embraced the cloud as a development organization you have to you just have to and you know you talk about you know, being a geek interpreter or an evangelist or whatever the term is and and I I recall the conversation that Steve Jobs had you know this is going back a ways but someone said to him you know what's the the value of object oriented technology and you know like the way that Steve approached things he he was sort of the the best of us all when it comes to tech evangelism. And he said, very simply, it's just better. It's just better. And if you look at the cloud and you look at the rate of change that you reference and how quickly you can deploy solutions and deploy updates to those solutions and update everybody at the same time on the same day, it's just better. So it is, I think, the right way for, for people to consider deploying these kinds of solutions. Um, it, you know, you could enumerate all the advantages, but it's just better. Um, regarding the other thing, you know, again, I don't want to turn this into a giant commercial for SAP, but um, it's not the first time I've heard the, the comment that, hey, I had no idea SAP did that. And I always like to say to people, you know, SAP is known for you know, working in the Fortune 500, but as it turns out, we have 300,000 customers. And every year we do the same survey, and in the Fortune 500, there are still only 500 customers. <laughs> so everybody else, also need some software, also need some business systems, and those are people we help. The vast majority of our customers are actually small and mid-sized customers, just because that's how the math works. Um, there's no other way the math works. So that, that's uh, that's something that we're very proud of. Um, and some of our solutions are, are uh, like you wouldn't believe, there's you know 50,000 people using uh, one of our mid small and mid-sized solutions. Yeah, that was for me. I, we interviewed um, at, at Sapphire Now. We actually had to interview um, one of the execs at uh, School Candy, and it was really interesting hearing um, him talk about. They, they felt like they got into the SAP solutions very early um, in their in their growth of their company, and then as their company grew, and then they were planning on going public. The fact that they had already kind of invested in a tried and true solution, um, kind of on the across their software platform, made that a much more reliable kind of opportunity for them as they went public. And, and I, it was one of those one of those conversations for me that really hit home because not only is it this disruption a thing, but it's really about understanding the value of you know SaaS based solutions. And a lot of what we talk about on the show, you know, swipe a credit card and go is great, but also kind of understanding the value, the risk, and a lot of those things that are out there, I think are equally as important. So the question number three that I had out there is, 
Daniel actually, and Daniel's not here to defend himself, but he actually wrote a book called um, about digital dragons and the idea of you know, you know unicorns and dragons and, and really this disruption side. And I know you talked in one of, one of your blog posts about the unicorn divide and the idea, I love the way you kind of talked about, we're all looking at, you know, the unicorns gonna come and disrupt, but it's called a unicorn for a reason, right? It's, it's few and <laughs> far between, but it, it doesn't mean that um, it doesn't exist. So I'm curious, this the unicorn divide concept, can you kind of bring people into what that thought process is and then how that kind of relates in this bigger disruption transformation conversation? Yeah, sure. Um, and you know, you, you hear the word unicorn, it would actually, uh, if you go back and trace it back, it goes back to a blog post by a venture capitalist named uh, Eileen Lee about uh, three, four years ago. And she saw all these amazing companies come out of nowhere um, the one we hear the most about, of course, would be Uber. And you know, hats off to those guys. Um, that you know, sixty-two and a half billion dollar valuation, way to go. That's pretty good. Um, so this stuff makes for great copy. Like people write about it. There's lots of uh, excitement around them. There's uh, tons of articles being written every day. And uh, yeah, everybody says, hey, we have to sort of be like Uber. So that uh, that unfortunately, I think I said earlier, we seem to be going a little more negative. A lot of the conversations I see people putting out there, and I think it's even the title of this thing, it's, ooh, you have to adapt or die, or Uber is, or some Uber-like business is going to come and get you. It's, right. it's turned into a total boogeyman story. And I really think that's unfortunate because so much is out there. So much is just lying around for us to pick up and start to use. Um, I, I think this whole negative thing, it's, it's really unfortunate. So I, I love that you said that because I always laugh. You know, it's you have to have an Uber conversation when you're talking about uh, unicorn. You have to have the, the the flip side is you have to you know use Blockbuster as an example of someone that that didn't you know um, see the writing on the wall. But I or also look at it a lot and in like you know it's we're not all Apple. We're not all you know the Ubers of the world. But at the same time, we have to kind of like you know look at this as you know what does the disruption mean? And I and I'm curious from your your standpoint. I think of I worked in cybersecurity and then I worked in a data center company and we were migrating a data center for all of our clients into the cloud. And we had you know, a traditional data center as well as kind of the hybrid model. And for me, shadow IT was probably one of, in my opinion, like the great drivers of cloud adoption because as, as the CIO that ha used to have the only button that deployed technology, all of a sudden would do a, a sniff on their network and realize they had all of these ports and all of the software running that wasn't on their approved list or wasn't part of their, um, their normal role. And they had to kind of figure out how that all fits in there. I'm curious, you know, privacy, security, you have these things that kind of come in there. And I, we even had one of our guests say, they don't call it, uh, I can't remember what they call it, they called it, um, personalization of uh, software purchasing when it, rather than shadow IT, make it a little bit less negative. But I'm curious, what are your thoughts? What was, what's some of the driving forces, not only for cloud adoption, but that are leading into this digital disruption that we see today? Well, I think that shadow IT, um, again, we talked about earlier, the explosion of cloud everywhere, the shadow IT, the fact that people are sneaky out and, and kind of buying their own departmental solutions, um, you know, the CIO hat I would put on says, you know, that's a bad thing. That's a, that's a hard thing to control. But, you know, the disruptor or innovator or appreciator of technology in me applauds that. I mean, there's nothing wrong with a good skunk works, you know, provided eventually it finds its way back to the mainstream. Um, that's a source of innovation. And there's, there's nothing wrong with that kind of uh, line of business solution going in and throwing one of those things in there. Um, Again, provided it, we all eventually learn how to play nice in the sandbox all together. So I think it's a source of a disruption. And you know, I think in general, it's a good thing. Um, we've got, uh, you know, in our world, we have solutions that are very, very narrowly focused. We have one uh, just as expense reports. You know, everyone hates doing expense reports. If you work in a business, you got to fill out all the receipts and everything, get that right. We have a line of business solution that just does that. And is that shadow IT? Is that uh, departmental IT? Sometimes. Um, but it certainly can be integrated in with the whole and have it make sense. So I, I think you have to let that breathe a little bit. You have to have a little bit of room for that kind of uh, experimentation at the edge or you're never going to get disruption. Uh, it's really hard to programmatically generate disruption. Uh, in fact, if you go back to Eileen Lee's blog post and you, know, you mentioned about the probability of these things, you, know, you got to read the whole post. 
right. you know, a unicorn is a is a rare thing. And to create an Uber, you know, the odds of doing that under, you know, sterile laboratory conditions in the valley where you've got all the engineering and all the management and all the capital and and basically the whole support infrastructure to make one of those things work. Uh, you know, Eileen Lee ran the math on it. It's like one in 1500. Wow. That's your odds in the valley under laboratory conditions, professional driver, closed course, you know, that kind of stuff. So I, I think you have to take the opportunities where they, where they uh, lie to try to generate innovation. And you also have to be able to, to try a few things and screw up a few things. That, that's okay too. I love it. I, 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 I preach a lot about failure and vulnerabilities on a lot of stuff that, you know, that I focus on as well. And, and actually you led it perfectly into the kind of this next question. And, and I love it. And I think you actually presented it this way. And one of the chapters in my, in my upcoming book is, you know, the future of innovation is collaboration. I, I really believe in uh, the idea of collaborations uh, as one of the essential elements of innovation. But you made a statement that I actually, I, I completely agreed with. And then I started looking at, wow, what about all these businesses and how do they convey it? And you made a statement just kind of, a business's success has a lot to do with how they portray their commitment to innovation. And I think that's powerful. But how are, you know, kind of give us a little background on that. And then what are some examples of how businesses actually demonstrate that, right? Because I think we have a lot of people here that are maybe a small to medium sized business owner. Maybe they're a decision maker in their company. And when they look at that, they say, yes, our commitment to innovation is important. But how do they convey that outside the walls? And, and kind of how do you see that kind of growing from there? Yeah, that, uh, that I think is the central conversation, you know, probably of the year. Um, you look at survey after survey after survey, and, and believe me, like I get all of this stuff, it comes through. You, I'm sure you see it too. Uh, my favorite one, I think, is I think it was a McKinsey survey. It came out in April. It said that, uh, let's see if I get these numbers right 84% of executives believe that innovation is absolutely vital to their ongoing business, their ongoing survival, their ongoing success, absolutely vital. And then you like read the rest of a survey. I'm a big fan of reading these things to the end, if you haven't picked that up. Um, and it says 94% of them are actually satisfied with how they're doing. That is the big disconnect. Yet yeah, everybody agrees, you know, innovation's vital. And it's really, really easy to say that. Um, then, you know, you take that next step and how do you walk that? How do you back that up? And that, that's what I spend a, a fair amount of time talking to our customers about. Um, that I think is kind of the missing piece of this whole story. And it's one of the things that our friends, the unicorns have given us. I think they've given us some real gifts. Um, there's a whole bunch of technology that's now just lying around waiting for us to pick up. Because what did Uber do? You know, right. Uber basically, I don't want to minimize their achievement, but they basically integrated a few APIs and, you know, with some really, really good design, some really good, uh, you know, very customer centric design, they created a, you know, a three tap to $62 billion business when you get right down to it. So I, I think those are, those are two of the gifts that these unicorn companies have given us. And I don't think enough companies are, are picking those gifts up. So, you know, you ask, what can you do? Well, it, it, you have to do more than just say, we're committed to innovation yes. or, or otherwise, like you're just like these guys saying, you know, you have to go out and respond to uh, the Ubers or the Ubers are going to get you. Um, and it's not as hard as everybody thinks. Um, I think innovation starts with a commitment from, you know, the uh, top of a company. And then you can actually take some real concrete steps. Um, you can study projects that make sense. There are defined methodologies that the unicorns have, have really popularized. Design thinking, I think, is the, the easiest, biggest, uh, most accessible one. And people can learn that stuff. It's a learnable methodology. You don't have to be a genius. You don't have to wait for the lightning to strike for a really creative idea. You can actually almost methodically do this stuff. You can uh, do it in a repeatable, trainable fashion. So I'm curious, you know, and actually uh, Nathan Weaver, uh, and thank you guys that are joining here. I'm, you know, we have uh, our live audience that are, are kind of watching here. I would love to hear how many of you feel that either the company you're working in or the company that you kind of do a lot of business with does a good job of portraying their commitment to innovation. Cause I think this is a, a very interesting one. Cause I actually think almost, I, I believe a lot in transparency, especially from a business 
uh, perspective, you know, with data and and even as businesses fail, I like to use the Target example of, you know, Target, if they, it would have been a better job of, uh, you know, engaging and being transparent out of the gate. Maybe when things did fall off the rails, people would have forgiven them. Unfortunately, they came and asked forgiveness far too late in the, in the, in the game. But I, I guess one of the things, you know, failure, vulnerabilities, disruption, these are, you know, we, we, we started the show off by saying there does have this negative connotation and, and kind of this why is change kind of looked at a little bit more negative? Is there maybe a way or how you kind of talk about allowing your failures to be exposed to show your kind of commitment to innovation? Because I, I love seeing a business that talks about the 11 iterations of a device before it actually got taken out of it. You know, and I think those those are the stories that we hear all the time as the ones where our favorite you know, our favorite champions are the, you know, are the people that, you know, got, you know, I always use like Oprah Winfrey or even Michael Jordan that, you know, got told that he was too short to play basketball, but yet we're not very good at talking about those failures along the way. It's more of like, after we succeed, we look back and say, oh yeah, this is all the things that, that failed. But what are your thoughts there on kind of that vulnerability of a business to highlight their commitment to innovation? Well, I think you can uh, actually define, and again, there's, not to harp on design thinking, it's not the only tool, but it is certainly one of the best tools. Design thinking as a methodology creates a nice safe little zone where not only can you fail, you can actually get you know pretty crazy in there. Right. You can start suggesting ideas that you know really you, you wouldn't have gone to. Um, and again, with practice, organizations can develop this and this becomes a competency. And I can you know, give you an example of, uh, of where an idea that would never have been suggested led to something bigger. You know, I was talking to um, a company and they're in the mining business. And you think, okay, pretty straightforward business. You find some, uh, like a mountain, you dig a hole in the mountain, you take the valuable stuff out. Well, it turns out it's a lot more complicated than that. Um, and it turns out that the experts you need to, you know, survey the geology of the wall inside the, that's the depth of the mountain, Turns out those people are pretty hard to come by. They're pretty rare. A senior geologist um, is a hard person to find. So what do you do? You, you have to send these people into sometimes dangerous areas all around the world. They fly all over the place. They're away from their families. Um, and you tend to go through a lot of geologists because it's, it's not a great job that you would want to stick to. So how do you innovate in that kind of capacity? And how do you take advantage of some of the tools that are just lying around and, and uh, you know, apply kind of these design thinking methodologies to, to see if you can do something innovative. So one of the discussions we had with these guys was a design thinking session. And in these sessions, like the rules are, there are no bad ideas. Yes. And you've heard that expression, but you really have to create an environment, a workshop where that's true. So um, sometimes you deliberately introduce a provocative idea just to see if it'll lead you somewhere else. And the example we gave was, what if we took all of the mines and we moved them somewhere where the geologists would want to be? What if we took all the mines and we moved them to Las Vegas? We'll just pick them all up from wherever they are, from the dangerous parts of you know, the third world and stick them all in Las Vegas. And your first reaction, if I said that to you in a regular meeting, would be, that is literally the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Right. But if you create this environment where it's safe to have these conversations, that can actually provoke a further thought, which was, hey, wait a second. Maybe instead of moving the mines to Las Vegas, why don't we move the mines to the geologist? Instead of having the geologist go to the mines, we'll bring the mines to the geologist. So what do we wind up with? We wind up with a senior geologist sitting at home in you know, his or her den, watching a giant plasma TV, as a junior geologist goes out to the actual mine, looks at the uh, rock face with a, a 4k GoPro strapped to his head and now you can actually have that person be in six different minds in six different time zones on the same day so you kind of fail your way to success and you know sometimes you don't fail your way to success sometimes you fail your way to failure right but you have to create <clears throat> an environment and a workshop and these methodologies are great for it where this kind of stuff is possible and that's not a huge commitment from businesses. It's really concrete. It's something direct they can do um, almost immediately. And it, it's not hard to learn. I learned it. Um, I've probably taught this to like 100 people. I've never seen anybody that can't do it. 
Yeah, I, I can say I was uh, lucky enough to be uh, one of the programs I was in for another company. Uh, they actually put us through it as well. And it was it was uh, very eye opening. And especially uh, I, I kind of in my path in my career, I, I, I built my career after kind of Guy Kawasaki and Robert Scoble, the idea that uh, technology evangelist. And, and it was funny, I would go with a lot of businesses and we were working in data center and cyber and, and solution adoption. And, and I would come out and they would say, but Brian, you didn't really implement any new technology. You actually took out more technology or changed the process. And, and that's kind of why I kind of reintroduced it as a change evangelist, because it wasn't about new technology or, you know, it's oftentimes just asking a question you didn't know you could ask or re-examining, you know, that, I mean, in Uber's case, they simply took something that we already were doing on an every minute basis and said, you know, what what is a better way of doing this? And it's not about brand new, you know, hauling a taxi um, is not a concept that is, uh, is mind blowing and even doing it to your phone. And I'm curious, you know, there's a lot of conversation, you know, Dollar Shave Club is, uh, is a good example. What role, in your opinion, does timing play? Because you know, I do a lot in the live streaming space and uh, Periscope and, and uh, Facebook Live and these technologies that came out in the last 18 months are very fun, very innovative. But I tried technology four years ago that was the exact same technology. But unfortunately, our phones weren't good enough, our cellular networks were, and our culture wasn't ready for that kind of like self egotistical looking into your phone live streaming that kind of exists. So what role do you feel kind of timing plays in this innovation and disruption game that we're kind of living in today? Uh, it's critical, obviously. And um, I think a lot of people are, uh, are I'll just call it what it is. They're incredibly lucky. Um, there's another word and there's another word we can use for that. And it's, it's probably the single biggest gift that we've gotten from Silicon Valley in the last 10 years. Um, it's one word. The word's pivot. Mm. That's where you get to something and you realize, oh, I'm not quite right. And pivot's another word for fail. Uh, we can say that here. We're all friends. Yes. And so you, you you try something that it's not quite what you thought, or maybe you find something surprising at the bottom of that well, and it's fortuitous. You you just caught a break, um, and don't let anybody you know. You look at all these massive successes. Don't ever let them tell you that they didn't catch a break somewhere along the way. Right. Amazon, Facebook, Google. You know, you get on the list. Uber. Uber started out as a car service. The original audience for Uber, uh, for Uber, if you go back all the way and you look it up, uh, was actually going to be about 60 people. Wow. It was originally designed specifically for the venture capital community in Silicon Valley. That was it. It was just a car service for those guys. And then pivot, <laughs> and you suddenly find out that you can you know, launch this thing in basically every jurisdiction in the world uh, that has taxis, and then begin to build out further services from there. So, you know, timing is vital. And again, that's what I think a lot of people are missing right now is that there's a general acceptance and there's even an expectation that, hey, why aren't you doing something like this? I talk to customers about this all the time and and um, they say, well, uh, digital transformation stuff's not for me. It's like, well, who's it for that? Um, it's happening all around us. And the pieces are literally lying right there for us to pick up. And uh, it's time we did so. So, okay, so I'm gonna expand on that question because that's one of the, uh, the questions that I kind of was kind of wrapping this around. And those that are watching live, if you have questions on there, just throw your questions in the live chat and um, I'll bring in some of your questions here to the conversation as well. But okay, to that point, when you have a business that's out there, maybe someone that's watching right now and they look at disruption and transformation and unicorns and say, okay, I need to, I need to okay, I, I get it, I, I'm, a, I'm on board. But where do I start? Like, and I think you know, on your in the in some of your writings that I've read, a lot of it is you know, preparing for the unicorn. But that doesn't mean that the unicorn doesn't come. That your preparation wasn't worthwhile because it can it can reap benefits in many other different uh, arenas. So where where would you recommend? How would you start with a, a business that says, okay, I get it, I'm on board, but um, you know, now what? Yeah, and that that I think is a is uh, an important point to take from all this is that, you know, the unicorns, they make great copy. We all love talking about them. Um, everybody loves Uber. Everybody loves Airbnb and, and all the rest of these guys that are getting all this ink spilled. But when you're actually talking to real people in real companies about, you know, real uh, strategy, honestly, I have to say, and this is a little bit of a heresy, so I'm just going to say it. The unicorn thing is a distraction. Um, 
if you go into an executive's office and say, you got to watch out um, because, uh, you know, a unicorn's going to get you, or you should think about becoming a, uni a unicorn yourselves. Honestly, they just dismiss it. Right. And that, that to me is kind of a tragedy because I think they're, they're missing out on the opportunities. <clears throat> so, what, I mean, what do you do? You don't have to hit a home run every single time. Um, in fact, you should try to hit a single or even hit a bunt. Like, just get in the game is the idea. Get good at this. Innovation, I think, is a competency. It is something you can learn how to do. It's something an organization can learn how to do. Uh, I think it is a trainable thing. And there's enough methodology out there. And I'm not making this stuff up. This is not me inventing this. This stuff's been around since the 1960s, for crying out loud. Um, it went on 60 Minutes, I think, in 2008, you know, the design thinking design session. Thinking. And suddenly exploded, and everybody's doing design thinking. But it's not new. Um, it is a repeatable process. And if you want to start with something very simple, here's what you do. You go to your company, and you get the top three or four executives in a room, and you ask them one of two questions, or you ask them both. You say, what are your aspirations in the next five years? Or what is the single biggest thing that is keeping you up at night? The one thing on your, you look down at your profit and loss statement at the end of the month, well, one thing that you just want to stab somebody over, what is that thing? And then you say, okay, well, why don't we look at that? Why don't we drill into that, look at that and find out if there's something we can maybe do about it. But you, you start I somewhere. I love it. I love it. And actually, the the whiteboards behind or the white the butcher paper behind me is actually built on a, a live streaming project we're doing with a company. And we I started the conversation with define what success looks like and give me one problem that if I hit the home run, you'd you double my double my uh, salary. And they and they the way they brought that to me was very much on that. And we've kind of turned it into kind of a a multi-tiered solution and kind of thinking outside that. I I love that. I see some people. On the other side, you're talking about innovation as a uh, competency. I don't think we've heard that on the show before. So I think that's a that's a good one-liner. I call it a tweetable. It's a really good tweetable for sure. There's one other thing you can do if, if you really, like if you're, um, and again, it, it sometimes help in, it helps in this role. If you really feel like poking the bear, you go into that room with those, with those senior managers in your company or, or whatever it is, and you, um, you, know, you have this conversation and you ask them one question. Are you thinking big enough? Are you thinking scale? And again, I have these conversations with, with these customers all the time, and it's really fun. It's not very often you get to walk into a room and kind of go, boop, and you know, hit an executive right between the eyes. And usually what happens is there's a moment where they pause, and then the waves come, come out. Like they, um, the, the ideas that come rolling out of these people, uh, if you remove the notion of, you know, Forget about your current constraints. What could you do if you were an unconstrained, uh, in an unconstrained environment? Forget about resources. Forget about what's technically or economically feasible. What could you do with you know, your imagination being the limit? And again, you, you know, there's an old expression. Um, my boss, I think it's originally Confucius, but my old boss really corrupted it badly. And he says, if you shoot for the moon and you miss, you're still in space. <laughs> that, that's something you can do in, in these kinds of meetings and and uh, they're fun meetings it, it's not very often you get to sit down and actually reinvent the way a business runs or you know create something new so you know people really tend to engage in that and you you would be surprised how quickly people will pick that up so yeah you know, I, I think it's interesting you know one of those things that, you know as we talk about disruption and transformation i think too often it's linked Directly to technology and software, right? And as you were explaining it there, the the, the really the, it was coming down to methodology and strategy and people and really even culture and the culture being uh, kind of designed to allow that. And you know, I I think it's a it's an interesting trend because I I believe uh, I, I'm excited because I feel that the technology now we are finally hitting a, a cusp to where the technology is gonna be less the focus and the experience and the the uh, these other elements that we've all kind of been a major part of it and i'm a i have five device mobile devices for the work that we do i love iphones my twitter handle is i social fans but i i joke all the time that you know the iphone 7 i don't want that because i want the technology that it's in it 
and really, you know, it's going to make me get rid of my, my headphone port. So I'm not even sure if I want it in general, but I want it because of the experience that I'm going to be able to now be able to have because of the new technology. Maybe it's faster. Maybe the camera is better. So it's better pictures of my daughters. And, and I want the technology for that reason, not because I just need another iPhone or give, you know, Tim Cook and, and them more money. So I'm curious in this, in this scheme and, and this mindset, you know, I, we talk a lot about millennials and I, I'm a pager wearing millennial, which I means I'm 35. I'm around the, 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 uh, the cusp of millennial gen, uh, gen Xer. And, you know, millennials are now taking over uh, 50% of the workforce, but I don't look at a millennial as someone that would technically make them more, uh, I'd say disrupt enabled or, um, open to transformation. I think it's kind of like a misnomer, but what role do you feel kind of either hiring or culture fit for people kind of play in this innovation and disruption so that you can have a lot of these strategies and methodologies in place? Is it a place where uh, I sometimes say you have to hire and fire for culture fit, which I know scares a lot of people, but is it is it one of those or is it really, can it, you said, you know, innovation can be a, a, a competency. Is it a training aspect where you can train people to kind of embrace this piece to actually enable the transformation? Oh, I think we lost your audio. Did you hit the, is it mute there? Oh, no. Uh, on the screen is the, is the button on the bottom. Did you hit the mouse by chance on the, uh, on your, on your little square is on the bottom of the screen in your square. Is there a, just do me a favor. Just hit refresh on the browser real quick and it'll bounce you out and I'll bounce you right back in. I'm not sure what happened there. Yeah. Just hit refresh, refresh on the browser. All right, just give us one second. Disruption disrupted his audio, but uh, I'm loving this conversation. Thank you guys all for joining, and I love all the comments on the side here too. Um, so much great insights here on really how we can think about this across the board. Oh, I see a blinking Glenn. Too much fire overwhelmed the systems. Well, maybe that is the case. Oh, there you are. We're back. Oh, I got rid of my little cloud background. Are we good? We're good. I can hear you loud okay. and clear now. Sorry about that. No, no worries. Um, so let's. Uh, where were we? Um, hey, we got disrupted. We got disrupted. There was a unicorn that uh, that flew into the audience. Yeah. Yeah. So what role does people play in culture? Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't think there's a big secret there. I think. Um, if you look at how do you do this disruptions thing, how you really sit down and you know constructively, deliberately pursue innovation, um, where it comes from is a diversity of ideas. And the millennial folks, I don't, you know, millennial is just a is a demographic term. I, I think for our purposes today, I think I would almost prefer a term like digital native. People that are so accustomed to the use of technology that's been an everyday part of their life for as long as they can remember they can bring a fresh perspective to business problems. And, you know, diversity, when you are sitting down to solve a different problem, you know, it will give you so many different perspectives, so many different points of view. And if you have a perspective of, well, why do I have to go through all these steps? Why don't I just press a button or just speak to the thing or whatever? It, it allows people to review a problem from a different point of view. And, and uh, you sometimes see cleaner, clearer solutions because that's what these folks are accustomed to. That's what uh, they've come up with. I would never count myself a millennial. I would uh, probably have to say my kids are drifting to the uh, millennial territory. But you know, I could give you all kinds of examples where we've uh, run run uh, sessions try to try to generate innovation. Uh, I was doing one at a company that makes cement. I'm not making this up. This is innovation in the cement business. Yeah, okay. My grandfather owned a cement company in Pittsburgh growing oh, up. So I, I'm familiar with that. This is the you know the drill. Like, you know when they last, the last time they changed the recipe for cement? Never, Roman, right? okay? <laughs> this thing is a couple of thousand, 2,500 years old. So right. you would innovate in this. And so what do you do? You bring in people with different perspectives, not just people with the cement perspective. We brought in a guy from um, an airline to try to talk to them about, you know, how do we approach customer service? We brought in people from um, from uh, different parts of the world and we brought in some uh, younger folks who looked at this and said, well, why are you guys working so hard? Like, why can't I just have it on the phone? And so it's that 
that mix of perspectives that gives you the value in, in terms of generating new ideas. And like we've got a great resource in this millennial community because like they are extremely technically literate and they can see solutions that even like hardcore tech folks, you know, who've been in the IT, who've been in that data center working for that CIO that they just don't see. Uh, and, I, and I love that. And, you know, uh, I talk a lot about digital native versus digital dinosaur. And uh, the, my, the book is a, a millennial mindset. It's the byline is it's not the year you were born. It's your ability to embrace change, collaboration and community. And I think, you know, like to me, that's a lot of what they said. I, I, you know, um, and, and Karen even said, you know, uh, the tagline is born digital. And I, I love, you know, even SAP's mantra of, of go live and the idea of, of live in real time. But um, the, we also had a good question here from Karen, and I'm curious what your thoughts are. You know, you made the comment about pivoting. And I've been an entrepreneur now for almost three years after working in uh, the enterprise space and, and, and for a data, a data center startup for about 12 years before. Um, and I would say I probably, I even wrote a blog, blog post about, you know, I've pivoted probably 10 times in that three years, which means I've, I've, I've failed in my direction and, and, and where I was going. And I'm very, I love that. That's the reason I, I really uh, enjoy what I do. I'm, I'm able to really, uh, you know, pivot when I feel I need to pivot. But one of the things that I look at is I don't think Pivoting is necessarily only an entrepreneur um, type role. You know, a lot of the things that we're doing with uh, even SAP from a live streaming space. I mean, SAP uh, is responsible for the largest uh, live streaming event at the Super Bowl, which is what we are a part of. And Ursula Ringham is here, was our, our change agent that made that happen. And that was SAP driving that. That wasn't some innovative entrepreneur or startup that was, uh, you know, uh, an Uber-like. But what are corporations failing at while entrepreneurs are succeeding kind of in this transformation space? What would you look at as some of the traits there where you see entrepreneurs kind of, I guess, maybe embracing this a little better or maybe just being more open about how they're doing? Well, I think uh, corporations, they have, they have cons uh, constraints, especially public corporations. Um, and a lot of it has to do with um, intellectual property ownership. So, you know, if, you, if you're an entrepreneur and uh, you want to work at a, a large corporation, you know, there's a limit to how much you can participate, you know, in the value that you're creating. So you might think to yourself, you're going to be further ahead if you if you go outside and, you know, spin something up and then hopefully, you know, you have an exit somewhere. Right. So I, I think that's a challenge for them. Um, having said that, like if you can attract a really smart group of people and, uh, you know, put them in, in a room, give them meaningful work and give them a direction to work at like you're going to get some amazing stuff. Um, we have some stuff coming out of a lab now. You know, I know you guys did a show about uh, AI and chatbots uh, yes. uh, a couple of weeks ago. We, we have some stuff coming out of the lab, uh, which, you know, applies that to actual enterprise conversations. So, you, you know, somebody has a, I think the example is like preventative maintenance, which you would think, you know, might not be the most exciting topic in the world, right. but wait until you're having a conversation, like an actual voice, conversation with a mobile device uh, to talk about, hey, what's going on with that pump or that uh, piece of equipment? And, you know, we're approaching the, you know, Iron Man Jarvis conversation with that in a very narrow scope, but you can do some really cool things inside corporations where you've got like massive resources to throw at it. So I think that's your trade-off inside versus outside. You have uh, a little bit more freedom, a little bit more uh, intellectual property ownership on the outside, but on the inside, man, it is something else when you have a lab of 30,000 people going at stuff. Yeah. And I always say, you know, I loved my enterprise life and the startup life that we had. I had, I had 129 software developers uh, at my disposal at the, the data center startup that we were working at. And I can tell you that that was a luxury that you you don't realize you, you really enjoyed when you were like, I just want them to make this make this button and make it very you know, intuitive and put it on my phone and I got it in 48 hours and now it's a, a different world. And I actually, I, I make it a note that a lot of most innovative things that I've done as an entrepreneur are with three large brands, IBM, SAP, and Dell. And those are the three brands I've done probably the most innovative things without question. And those are three giant enterprises, right? And I think, you know, the, the notion sometimes that, you know, the you know, grass is greener, I think is a, often one of those things. And I think um, entrepreneurship is, all of a sudden, uh, I think also taken on a, a sexy term in the sense of you're going to hustle and do what you like. But, you know, 
we all, there's also, there's a lot of the limitations and, and things that I, I think are good to kind of balance on the perks. And I also love being able to look at a small business to say, you no longer have to be an enterprise and you no longer even have to be a startup and you can take advantage of some SAP type solutions, or you can work and leverage a, you know, one of the, the major data mining tools that exists from another company. And I think the, I think that's kind of maybe the one of the things that's probably most exciting is that the transformation is also required some of the things that maybe the big boys only had, right? The, the, the only enterprises, you know, only the fortune uh, 500 and they kind of wrap this around, like you said, 300,000 customers and there's only 500 in the fortune 500. And, and so SAP is, is helping that many companies. And that just means more companies looking at, uh, you know, disruption and innovation. So I think we have about a minute or two left. What, uh, any takeaways, any advice that you would give the audience here that's listening that kind of are around this entire idea? Because I can really say I love the way you broke down and didn't really jump on the bandwagon of adapt or die. But at the end of your kind of a focus, a lot of it comes into you need to have a strategy that at least recognizes that this exists and walks you down a path that might you know, incorporate these new strategies and these new mindsets. So I'll let you kind of wrap it up uh, on your side and then we'll uh, let everybody get out of here. Yeah, I think uh, I think it is all in the title uh, of this whole session. The uh, the adapt or die thing, uh, you know, to me that that feels a little bit like sort of almost lazy marketing. It's like we're just going to give you the easy, scary message and try to scare you into doing something. And I, I think that unfortunately creates this distraction that uh, that you have to go big if you want to take advantage of this. And I, I think the gift of the unicorns, if you want to call it that is they've, they've left us some things. Um, they've, you know, we've invested billions of dollars in technology. We've, uh, you talked about timing. We've reached a point where all of these things are just lying around. You can get a blab, you can get Twitter APIs, you can get APIs to whatever you want. There are recipe managers on, there's all these bits of technology that are just lying there waiting for us to pick up and turn into something useful. And anybody can do it. You don't need to be GE or some giant company to do it anybody can do it with a little bit of effort and commitment. Um, I think the other gift is the methodologies that they've popularized that again are very mature. They've been around for a long time. People can learn how to do these. They, it's not going to take you 10 years to learn how to do it. Uh, with practice, you get better and better and better. And eventually, um, like we said earlier, innovation becomes a competency. Uh, and I think the third thing is, um, it also goes to timing, that people are expecting this now. If you're a small business and or a large business or whatever, and you want to try something new, uh, no one's going to be surprised. No one's going to be shocked. Even if you screw it up, no one's going to hold it against you. They're going to say, oh, OK, that they were attempting to transform something. And even as you fail, you may find yourself in a position to pivot to something that is wildly successful, as have so many other people before us. So that would be the message, I think, just to sum it up, is you don't have to shoot for the moon. You just have to get into space. I love it. I love it. And I can tell you, I was looking forward to the conversation, actually happy when Daniel told me he wasn't coming in because I like to talk a lot and it's a topic I like to talk a lot on. So it kind of worked out perfect. So uh, Glenn, thank you so much for your time and jumping in. You know, everyone that was watching, uh, the 81 people that are watching live and came through the show today, we are here every week, the same time, same channel uh, in this live, chaotic, disruptive transformation world that exists being consistent might be one of the keys that people don't talk about a lot. And we've been doing this show every Thursday at noon for that reason, to give you a kind of consistent home for this conversation and place that are out there. So we will be back again next Thursday at uh, noon Eastern. Uh, follow the hashtag Cloud Talk and Twitter. Make sure to follow the Twitter account uh, that, that Kristen and our team runs that will post uh, replays for this show as well as other content around this topic. So Daniel will be back next week. Daniel, I'll have a whole new topic, a whole new discussion. But uh, Glenn, thanks again so much for your time. Thank hey, you for, for sponsorship. Me. Cheers. Thanks, everybody.